I'm absolutely delighted um, that uh, Elena Chervi can come and speak to us about the rare situation of aortic dissection in children. And she's come to us as part of our extended network from Great Ormond Street. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me today, and it's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, we're going to, um, I'm not going to focus on aortic dissection in general, but uh, I'll just highlight a few points just to make the comparison with what we tend to see in children. Uh, as you know, these are the figures that are usually reported, so the incidence of aortic dissection tends to be estimated in three in 100,000 from hospital cohorts, but in fact, autoptic series tend to present a um, um, much nastier uh, prevalence of uh, up to 3%. Uh, it seems to have a, a, um, a male uh, prevalence, and uh, the peak incidence in, is in the sixth and um, uh, to the eight, eighth uh, decade of life. And when it happens in younger people, you need to be a bit suspicious that might be connective tissue and uh, um, genetic conditions that Bijo touched on, uh, or pregnancy as a trigger. Uh, clearly, the mortality is very high if left untreated, um, um, and uh, it's up to 50% uh, in the first uh, two days. Uh, acute aortic syndromes do uh, comprehend uh, different diseases, so we're now starting to uh, make uh, some um, uh, difference between dissection, intramural hematomas, and penetrating ulcers. And we also know that aortic rupture is uh, something that we need to be aware of, especially in road accidents, because it uh, causes up to 20% uh, of uh, trauma fatalities in, in, in road accidents. Uh, it does present as a, a tearing chest pain, radiating to the back and migrating possibly with the extension uh, of the, the section itself. And then there might be other signs, but uh, you all know that the problem is there are many, many other diseases that are mimickers, and especially in the adult po population, there are many other diseases that are much more frequent than aortic dissection itself. Uh, so if you want to get it right, you really need to think aorta if uh, uh, the pain is there and there is suspicion. And clearly this is much more so in children where uh, the, the disease, the dissection itself is extremely rare and the pediatric A&E setting, you can imagine how this is something that never comes to mind. Uh, so awareness is especially important in the, in the, in the, in the younger population, physicians uh, looking after children. This is very busy, but it, just to give you an idea that this is everything that is reported from the epi epidemiologic point of view view about children, so it's only 370 cases reported in literature, so it's definitely something very rare and much rarer as compared to, uh, to adults, to the extent that extrapolating numbers from these studies and adult studies, if we think about the London population, uh, we believe that we, we might expect 250 to 500 cases of uh, um, acute um, dissection in, a, in the adult population, uh, and there's a, a pretty recent uh, Oxford study uh, where they um, they broke it down and they realized probably 188 of them uh, with type A dissection survived to hospital. When we think children, then the number go, goes down pretty much and we, uh, we would expect one to three cases a year. And in fact, in the three big uh, uh, cardiac hospitals in London, so the Royal Brompton, the Evelina, and us at Great Ormond Street Hospital, we all have anecdotal reports of aortic dissection Unfortunately, the vast majority of them is people that were picked up late in our network, so in local hospitals, and they didn't make it to the, the tertiary center uh, because there was a delay in, in diagnosis. But again, we, c we don't have big series, we're just talking small numbers. Um, and when we go uh, uh, and look at the, at, at the risk factors that we can recognize, uh, one of the first efforts was the International uh, Registry of uh, uh, Acute Aortic Dissection with many centers uh, collaborating around the world, and it was established more than 20 years ago now. And they reported uh, in uh, 2015 about the, uh, the risk factors on more than 4,000 uh, dissection uh, cases. And you can see how the conventional cardiovascular risk factors, as 
as Beechill pointed out earlier, like hypertension and atherosclerosis played a major role in patients that presented with acute aortic dissection and also having a known aortic aneurysm and previous cardiac surgery were other determining factors. But you can see how Marfan syndrome, and there's no mention of other more rare disease, uh, only seemed to play a very, a very small role in this cohort. Uh, when we look at children, and this is one of the biggest, uh, not only epidemiological, but, only with, uh, but also with some clinical details about the population included, uh, but this is looking at uh, children and, and young adults, so up to 30 years, but it's 110 um, cases of, of dissection, so it's a, a big cohort for the pediatric group. Uh, we can see there's a, um, there's a, a, a bimodal distribution on, um, uh, on the right-hand side, where in the first year of life, uh, there's a higher incidence of dissection, and then there's another peak uh, around the teena uh, teenage years. And if you go and look at what are the causes, uh, you can clearly see that in the first year of life, it's more congenital heart disease that contributes to the risk, while when they grow up and they're teenagers, it's trauma and connective tissue disease that seems to be more prevalent. Um, this is another uh, report, and we can see here how hypertension only play, that was so important in adults in children is only uh, only accounts for 70% of uh, of these kids, uh, while Marfan syndrome uh, goes up to 24%. And just to remind you, this was an era where Lois Deer syndrome was not even described. So we're talking Marfan, but probably we are including many other diseases that were that are not uh, very well identified uh, even now, and trauma also uh, seems to play a very big role. So if we compare uh, adults to kids, we see that hypertension and atherosclerosis play a major role in adults, clearly without forgetting that having a connective tissue disorder underlying or uh, acute stress to the aortic wall or a pregnancy as a trigger might be contributing factors. But in kids, you always need, if there's aortic disease, you always need to think there's something behind. So if there's no congenital heart disease, no, then you need to look for other uh, inherited or genetic causes of it. Um, at Great Ormond Street Hospital, you know, it's a very uh, big pediatric center with more than 60 specialties under one roof, so clearly we tend to see very rare diseases that really need a tailored approach. And the aortic uh, clinic uh, comes under the Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Diseases, so the setting is that of a multidisciplinary uh, team with a very strong component coming from the uh, inherited and rare uh, disease world. Uh, it was the, the clinic was set up in 2012, and as you can see, it, it, it has seen a very steady increase in, in numbers. We are, we're seeing more than 400 children um, at the minute, and that doesn't include any of the congenital heart disease or the most common, like bicuspid aortic valve, because they tend to be seen in the general uh, pediatric cardiology clinic. So we really focus on rare conditions that have an uh, inherited component to them. How we get the referrals is usually family history, so Bijel and Kate might send kids of uh, people that they see in clinic, or they have somatic features that they, they, they look like they might have syndromic autopathy, or they are picked up uh, to have an abnormal echocardiogram that is done for a completely different reason, or they're seen by other specialists because they have an underlying condition that will warrant cardiac surveillance, like we're understanding that uh, Turner girls tend to have a higher prevalence of high blood pressure and uh, um, dilatation of the aorta, even as teenagers. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of what we see clearly. Uh, I look after the uh, more the inherited aortic disease with some bicuspid and Turner girls uh, coming across, and there's a bit of an over overlap there with congenital heart disease. Uh, there are syndromic and non-syndromic conditions, and, and the list is just tiny, but it goes on. There's many more that are extremely rare and really need a, a, a tailored approach. And unfortunately, so far, we have some uh, risk profiling for the, the, um, the ones that have been around for longer, like, say, Marfan syndrome, vascular EDS, we, we don't know much, Lois Dietz, we're starting to understand. But clearly, the ones that there's just 50 or 60 cases described in the world, it's very difficult for us to understand what's, uh, what's the base, best way to treat them. We clearly don't, don't have any literature to support any medical therapy or surgical decision making. But we do know that dissection risk is much much higher with inherited condition as compared to congenital heart disease in general. 
And this again is what happens. We look after families like this Martha and family and we, we share it across two sites, BARTS and, and, and GUIs, but we clearly have close links because we try and provide a lifelong surveillance for all of them and um, to give advice and, uh, and support in any stage of life. Uh, and this is just to uh, um, quickly mention something about the specific conditions. So this is a pretty recent report from GENTAC, which is a big North um, American um, uh, database on um, the genetic um, profiling of uh, people with aortic and vascular disease. And they described uh, almost 800 Marfan patients. And of those, 183 were children, so it's a big quite a big number for, again, for us in pediatrics. And just one had an aortic dissection, the dissection before the age of 16, and he was a, um, a male, a boy, uh, 15 years old, and had a type B dissection. And of them, 18 had a prophylactic aortic root replacement during childhood. And they, they do comment, and I think it is very interesting in the paper itself, that the average age at prophylactic aortic surgery now, or when they did present in earlier stages with type uh, A dissection, is between 32 and 36 years of life, is when uh, the average age of death was described in the 70s, when the first epidemiological studies and uh, lifelong surveillance for mouth and patients were, were, were published by uh, Marduk. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what happens. For example, with mouth and kids, you can see that the, uh, the, the dislodged lenses, the chest wall deformity, the bent spine, the, the stretch marks, they, this is divided by, ter um, by, by age. So um, the, the younger kids are the blue one and the older kids uh, who are 15 years old are the gray ones. So all these features, they tend to um, not to be present when they're very young and then to manifest themselves um, at, a, at a later stage in life. So it can be quite difficult to pick them up just because they look like uh, Marfan. But if you look at their aortas, even if they're seven years old, their aortas tend to be large. And it's a high prevalence, 90%, and it tends to be consistent through, through the ages. That said, we know from the same study that prophylactic aortic surgery was only, um, um, was only performed in uh, um, a bit more than 5%, so those 18 children, and uh, this action happened just in one uh, case. But we, we do know now that even if you do not show all the features of Marfan, aortic dilatation tends to be there from the very beginning, and we have the impression that we need to do something about it if we know about it. Um, so this is pretty much our setup in clinic. It's pretty similar to what Bijo described um, about the setup here. And we, we do sit in clinic every other week with a geneticist. We have a genetic counselor. We have specialist nurses, um, close links with the uh, adult cardiologist and a psychologist available for families. Uh, and um, we find ourselves uh, needing help of other specialists, clearly, because they are affected by multisystemic diseases in the uh, vast majority of cases. And sometimes our expert uh, pathologists help us out uh, when, um, when there is the need to look at, uh, for example, post-mortem of other people uh, in the family. Uh, what they do have when they come to us is at every appointment, which is usually every six months or one year, depending on the underlying diagnosis, they get an ECG and an echocardiogram. We go for MRI scans because they are painless and there's no radiations involved. And usually we do it every year or every two years, again, depending on the underlying diagnosis, starting from the age of seven or eight, when they're able to be awake in the scanner. If we have concerns because someone is severely affected at a younger age and we want to have a good look at all the arterial tree, we can do it earlier than that. And that's either with a CT, which is very quick and can be done without sedation, or with a, an MRI under general anesthesia. Um, and clearly with the MRI, we get very nice pictures from head to uh, knee or head to toe, depending on what, what we think is your risk of having uh, extended vascular disease. And then we can have exercise tests, 24-hour blood pressure monitor, 24-hour ECG monitoring when it's uh, needed. 
our role is to help them, help the families, not only the children, but the families, and especially parents, tend to be uh, very worried about what they can or can't be because they're going to school, they're doing PE, they're very, we have kids that are very uh, into rugby or um, hockey when they come to us, and so it's all about trying to counsel them and try to find alternatives because they need to be included, they need to live a plenty and full life but also we need to uh, they need to be aware of what are the risks and what are the things that they, they should avoid and then about career choice and family planning uh, when it comes to the point of them wanting to start uh, their own family. Medical therapy so the two class of drugs that have been used uh, are beta blockers and sartans. Uh, in kids there is some evidence but it's not uh, as Bijo pointed out already, we don't have very solid, uh, solid literature about it, but what we tend to do is as soon as we have a diagnosis and um, if it is clinically or genetically confirmed, we tend to start um, um, children on, on medicines, at least one. Um, and then when it comes to surgical decisions, especially when they're very young or they have very severe genetic mutation, it's always an MDD discussion because as opposed to adults where there are guidelines to help, uh, to help us in management with children, we don't have age-specific thresholds, so it might be difficult to decide when it is time to operate in someone that is half the body size of, a, of an adult. And in case of acute events, clearly what we would uh, aim for is a timely diagnosis and safe managing, management, which, which involves an expert team where we have, like the MDT that um, Bijo mentioned, radiologists, aortic and vascular surgeons, cardiologists and intensivists, vascular surgeons, and interventional radiologists when it is needed. And earlier on this year, we, uh, we sat down and with, we tried to put our heads together and we agreed on a pathway for the management of acute aortic events uh, in the pediatric group um, at Great Ormond Street Hospital with the help of uh, vascular surgeons from the Royal London and uh, aortic surgeons from here from Bath and clearly our own surgeons uh, at Great Ormond Street. Thank you. <laughs>